Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 179 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with returning guest Marianne Wilburn about gardening in the winter. The plant profile is on Aronia, and we share what's going on in the garden as well as some upcoming local gardening events and garden tasks in the What's New segment. We close out with a last word on creating a healthy dip by Christy Page of Green Prints. This episode, we're joined by returning guest, Marianne Wilburn. She is a garden book author, speaker, and contributing editor to the Garden Rant blog. Welcome, Marianne. Hi, Kathy. So we've had you on this podcast. I think you were in our debut episode. For those longtime listeners, we've had you talk about chickens in the garden, summer cocktails, and of course, your book on tropical plants. And now we have you back today, incongruously talking about why winter garden. I know that's true. (laughs) I'm a tropical (laughs) plant gardener who likes winter. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, hmm, you're the tropical plant lady. Now, why (laughs) why are we talking about winter? So you're going to try to convince me the winter hater the cold weather hater, why we should garden in the winter and still pursue things. But before we dive into that, Marianne, we've talked about your background before and everything and longtime listeners can check those out. And I'll put links to your past episodes with us up in our show notes. But the last time we had you on was about May 2021. What have you been up to in the intervening time? Well, writing, obviously. And I have been doing a lot of travel and a lot of speaking. I've been really blessed to be able to speak to a lot of audiences across the U.S. And that speaking schedule is starting again tonight and moving on into February. So that's fabulous. And I'm talking about tropical plants, of course. And I'm also talking about my other book, Big Dream Small Garden. And I've been working on my new kitchen garden, my newly renovated kitchen garden. And that is so super exciting because it is, it's so beautiful. It's so geometrically precise. I love it. And it's in this big contrast to the wild ornamental garden. So working with those two things has been a lot of fun. Um, But I am winter gardening. That is the reason that I'm here to hit you over the head with it and try and bring you into my lair, right? (laughs) Yes. So um, I have to say, confess that I was going to use a graphic for this episode and intro us as the heat miser and the snow miser from Year Without a Santa Claus. Um, And I think I even bear a little physical resemblance to that heat miser. (laughs) because of your red hair yes yeah i've never styled it that way but maybe one day well i tell you what mine's going mine's going whiter and whiter every day so i may get to be the cold miser by the end of it yep you might be mr snow miser sooner than later so for those gen x out there and maybe other generations as well you can you can relate to us and I love a warm tropical Christmas. I don't know about you, Marianne. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved to be able to take my new bike or roller skates out to use that day <laughs> and not be pinned in for Christmas. Well, you know, I think that I can change your mind on this a little bit because I was you. I hated winter when I came out here because I am originally from California. I spent a good deal of time in the UK. And then we moved back here 20 years ago. And this is a deciduous, my husband calls it a wasteland. He's right with you. I haven't changed his mind (laughs) Uh, because we grew up in the mountains of California. So a lot of snow, but a lot of evergreens and here everything goes away and the grays and the, and the browns are, are, are pretty much that's the winter landscape. And so for several years, I really felt 
just like you do now, like I didn't want a winter garden. I didn't have any desire for it. I didn't see a point in it. And I actually actively wrote against it. I believe I've got a few articles that I'm sure people can dredge up that just basically say, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I don't, I'm not quite sure where the change happened, but I think it was being introduced to a lot of gardeners who did have stunning winter gardens. And I think that the very first one was Nancy Goodwin at Montrose. And have you been to her garden, Kathy? Get not in the winter time. I've only been there in the summer. And her snowdrop display is just off the charts. She's so well known for it. These incredible Mahonia in the forest and witch hazels and all of these different plants en masse, which started to make me think, okay, I'm not liking the winter garden because all I'm doing is throwing out some early February gold daffodils or some early Tate Tate daffodils and i've got a tiny little witch hazel and it's not really doing anything and so it's not going to make me think that there's anything worth doing out there but when you see that with patience and time you can create those layers all and you start to get further into that then you you can see a destination point it's when you start to be able to see that destination point that you start to go oh wow i'm in now I want to get really good at this because when you just have that sort of Arctic tundra that we all have here in the mid Atlantic, because that's what it sort of feels like, especially if you're in the city and you're just putting in a few little things, it doesn't feel like much. It sort of feels like you're spitting into the wind really, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm leaving my seed heads up. You know, there's grays and browns out there. The mm -hmm. ornamental grasses are getting, you know, looking a little weary at this point. So yeah, I'm like desperate for any flowering. So just my little winter jasmine by the back door and heathers, they're kind of getting me through. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the green that you have outside? Do you have a lot of evergreens? Very few? I would say not a lot, but m most of my azaleas now are evergreen. I've been switching over to more of the southern azaleas. Um, I have some mahonia, some akuba. You know different colors in that and then of course whatever evergreen ground covers that i have planted like the epimediums are pretty much keeping their foliage hellebores that sort of thing yeah do you grow any mahonia at all i do just one just one little paltry and it's it's putting up its little flower sprigs is it aquafolium or is it uh yep, yep. like soft caress or something mm -hmm. now you've got to try the mahonia urobracteata the soft caress that because mm. you're going to be hardy for that for me it just becomes a woody perennial it goes down to the ground it's alive but who cares because it's not coming back up but it's got to be yeah. hardy for you. I, I had a sample plan of that, and I don't know what happened to it. What did you do to it, Kathy? <laughs> I, I, I have to confess, it was in a pot somewhere. It never got in the ground. Oh. Um, so somewhere it might still be out there, but I think it's still, even for me, closer to the city, it's still very marginally hardy. Yeah, it's 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 a close one, but boy, if you are in zone sev, a strong 7B8, you can grow this plant, um, mm -hmm. particularly with some shelter, and it's worth growing if you see it. What a beautiful feathery and and blooming plant. Now, I have the Southern Living's other Mahonia, which is Marvel, and that is, a, is it in an Intermedia, I believe? I can't remember. But that is blooming right now, and it has been blooming for the last three weeks, and that is very, very beautiful. Looks more like an aquafolium. Uh, a very cool plant. But again, if that Mahonia is the only thing in the landscape, you know, it's it's sort of this, it just becomes this big pimple, basically, this big you know, pimple with, with yellow spots on the top. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to be thinking in terms of layering and the eventual winter garden. You have to put your back into it, basically, and, and have it not just be about one plant or some bulbs, but all of these different things happening. Witch hazel season is about to, to come up. Tell me that you have got a witch hazel, Kathy. Oh, yeah, I have a few. So I have the native ones, the vernalis. Mm -hmm. And then I have an amethyst, which is supposed to be blooming any day now, but I, I haven't seen any signs of life yet. 
that uh, I've got Rochester blooming right now, which is an incredibly fragrant uh, witch hazel, but it also holds it, its leaves. And I used to be annoyed by this. And then I saw it in Nancy Goodwin's garden, very tall, much, much bigger than mine. And I love the sunlight hit those orangey, taupey, whatever, tawny colored leaves with these bright, fiery orange blossoms. And the two of those things together, I went, oh, okay, I'm all right with that. That's, I'm not going to do anything about it. And actually Nancy said at the time that she used to come out with a pair of scissors and cut off every single one of those leaves. And then she finally <laughs> gave up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'll never go down that road. Mm -mm. Uh, but what a fragrance. If you're looking for a fragrance from a witch hazel, Rochester is your guy and is a fantastic, uh, fantastic one. I also grow Palida or Pali Palida. I don't Palida. know. Yep. Palida. Palida, which uh, is absolutely hands down my favorite. It is a very pale yellow. It is a beautiful vase shape. I've just put another one in, a second one in uh, to sort of echo through the garden. And I grow Wisley Supreme. Is it? It's Wisley Supreme. Yep. And I grow Jelena and Barnhart Gold and one other, Chantal, which is sort of an amber color. So I've got a few going on now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have the Wisley Supreme still in a container right now. And that one looks like it's, it's hopefully going to bloom soon. I am looking forward to the end of this week on Sunday, and I'm not sure when this is being broadcast, but the APLD Winter Lecture Series is... Uh, going to be at Brookside. And I'm really hoping I'm going to see some fun colors and maybe some early witch hazels there. We'll see. I'm not sure. Have you been in a while? Yeah, I actually was there recently for Silver Spring Garden Club meeting. It was close to dusk, so I didn't see much. I'm going to be there this weekend after we're recording this interview with our seed exchange there. And then our seed exchange the following week is at Green Spring Gardens in Alexandria, Virginia, which of course their witch hazel collection is oh, one yeah. of the best in the area. And that one, I usually expect to, to have like a five or 10 minute break in the seed exchange and run around and take witch hazel pictures that day. It's a, that's almost always first weekend of February that the blooms are up unless it's like you know, really sleety, um, horrible weather. Yeah, if you are trying to decide which witch hazel is for you, then you should absolutely look at them in growing in situ somewhere. And Green Spring is the place to do it because they have so many. Longwood's got a lot too, but Green Spring really has a lot. And so, mm -hmm. so much about a witch hazel, it's not just about the color, it's about the shape because they have vastly different shapes. And it's very difficult to find that information about what that shape is going to be because the vast majority of pictures on the internet uh, and in books are close-ups of the blossom so that mm -hmm. you can see the color. And so you could end up with something like, for instance, Barnstock Gold, it absolutely spreads itself out like a guy who's come to your party and laid on the couch, you know, and you can't, you're like, oh my gosh, you're just everywhere. But Palida is straight, uh, not straight up, but it is just beautiful V arching into the sky. So it's really important that you look for the habit of it as well as the color. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we did had a past episode of the podcast interviewing the folks at Greenspring about that collection. So I'll definitely link to that oh, in good. the show notes from here. And I'm going to dial you back a little bit on the Why Winter Garden and say, you know, there's that old saying, there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing or preparation. So what do you do to suit up, so to speak, to go out into your winter garden? Oh, wow. I could not agree with that more. This is, a, I just keep saying, bundle up, buttercup, bundle up, <laughs> because when you are warm, it is a different game out there. If you are cold, it's horrible. And you can be warm and you don't have to do it expensively. Uh, I have a whole bunch of different things that I've picked up from thrift stores that I just wear layered. And then I usually will cover it up with a waterproof layer. And I wear waterproofs on the bottom and on the top. My bottoms are Columbia waterproofs and my top is a lightweight barber jacket. Uh, and those two things stop me if I'm picking something up or if I'm kneeling down from getting wet. And wet is, is the key there. You get wet and you're done. 
You're mm -hmm. instantly cold. You're instantly annoyed. Uh, so those waterproofs, I would say, are the one of the most important things you can you can wear. Obviously, good boots. Uh, in fact, on in a, a couple days, I'll be doing a, just a little snippet on the Why Winter Garden Challenge on Instagram for snow tracks or yak tracks. Have you ever used those before? I haven't used them. I've seen them, though. They're super easy. They're very cheap. They're about $10 a pair. Um, in fact, I just saw them at Costco the other day. And they were about $10. And they're just a rubber, stretchy piece of rubber that goes under your boot and straps on with a piece of Velcro, which is a nice new thing. My old ones didn't have that. And they have these little, not crampons, but just little tiny teeth. So you don't want to walk over your wood floor <laughs> with them on your boots, but they hold the ice and they hold the slush and they hold the snow. So you've really got a, a strong uh, grip on the ground when you go outside. And it's a really quick thing to put on and off your boots if you're concerned about the ice out there. Hmm. Yeah, my thing is more the gloves, like fingers mm -hmm. getting cold and as you said, wet. And I inevitably soak my fingers no matter what, like mm -hmm. no matter how many layers of gloves or what I'm wearing, I'll stick my hand into a bucket or something and come up with a wet hand and then I'm like, I'm going in. Yeah, again, wet means you're annoyed. And the best glove that I can find for this was actually recommended to me by my container gardening friend, Andrea Gasper. And she uh, says, and I agree, that Bellingham's are the best glove for the gardener. They are insulated and they are dipped in, and I always get this wrong, I always want to say lycra, but it's latex. <laughs> and have a you know that you can work in them as long as you're not dipping your hand in a water barrel cafe i mean you know it's mm -hmm. winter as long as you're not doing that <laughs> then you're going to be okay and they're and i actually even wear them on my winter i take a walk every morning and you know i'm out there for two miles and my f sort of fleece gloves even the ones that look really fluffy and lovely my hands are always cold in those but if i have the bellingham's on they i'm in good shape hmm my previous trick is I would put mittens over the gloves mm -hmm. um, until I had to like, you know, do something dexterous with the fingers. At least I was keeping warmer that way, but still, you know, I'm not going to go out in a Victorian lady's muff and <laughs> my hands <laughs> tucked in. That. Yeah. When you separate your fingers in any way that that's, you've just created a lot more surface area for that cold air to hit. And so wearing mittens around in the landscape, if you can get away with it, if you can grip with it, if you don't have to do tiny little bits of, you know, very precise work, then by all means do it. And some things you can, you can hold a pair of pruners with mittens. Uh, you can, you know, uh, you can hold a pruning saw with mittens but you can't really seed so with mittens so no or any yeah. fine work yeah well i was going to say the other enemy to me in winter besides the cold is the short day length and it is just so demotivating to be dark at 4 30 for me and maybe i have sad seasonal affective disorder or something but i think all of us go into that hibernation mode and slow down and it is so hard to get any motivation to be out there it, it, that is true, but I'm going to have you try and look at it from a different point of view. And that is that every single day we get another minute or so of the day. And so, for instance, when on uh, New Year's Day at 4.55 a.m., uh, or I'm sorry, other way around, it, the sun was setting at 4.55 p.m. Mm -hmm. and it was coming up at 7.30 and, or 725, somewhere in there. And so now we've got the sun, we, we, it's going down at like 515 or so. We've got a full extra 25 minutes, just, and that's just in 24 days, and an extra five minutes or so on the sunrise in the morning. And if you are not an early morning riser, and I have roomed with you, so I know what kind of riser you are. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and it doesn't have anything to do with the early morning. No, but it does you, not. <laughs> if you're an early morning riser, you're not. 
this is the winter is your best chance to be able to enjoy a sunrise without too much work on your part because it's it really is coming up at 7 30 in the morning and that's not too much of a heavy lift to be able to watch that incredible show of the sun starting to come up over the horizon and just hit the trees with that beautiful warm cold light that w just weird light that's so gorgeous so there you go that's a way to look at it it's getting better every day yeah the the lengthening does help a little bit and then i was trying to find that vocabulary term that i had learned the other day i think it's apricity like mm -hmm. april but apricity mm -hmm. meaning the warmth of the winter sun and mm -hmm. really Marianne, when it's an overcast day in winter, don't even talk to me. Like that's how I feel. <laughs> but if the sun is on my back, you know, then I feel like, oh, now I know why the ancients worship this thing, this giant ball in the sky, because it is so warming and such a great thing. And, and think about the fact that they did not have the benefit of a little device in their pockets to tell them that on Friday, it's going to be about 60 degrees. So, mm -hmm. you know, whatever was happening right now is what was happening. Uh, so you can imagine when the sun comes out, it's just like, oh, wow, what a gift, what a joy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that is one of the things that we really have to absorb when we are working outside in the winter garden, when we're trying to create a winter garden, is we have to change our perspective about what we're seeing out there. The, the landscape is different. We should not be comparing it to the summer. It's a completely different animal. And if, it's, if your winter garden just looks like a messy, ugly version of your summer garden, that's just going to be depressing. And that's why thinking in terms of, of leaning into creating something out there, making it special for this season to enhance all of these beautiful little things that are happening that we don't get in the summertime. And you're going to say, oh, yeah, great. I'm glad we don't get icicles and I'm glad we don't get frozen petals <laughs> and stuff. But these are spectacularly beautiful moments that, you know, that we only get one season a year. And so if you can somehow shift where you are mentally towards that, towards those blessings that we get every time we, we see something new and you're warm because you've taken time to bundle yourself up, you're well on your way towards, hey, you know, maybe I should build a, a garden around this and be thinking in terms of those structures and bones so that I can enjoy this even more. Hmm. Okay, so you're trying to convince me that water daggers, icicles, are a good thing. <laughs> they are beautiful. <laughs> and yes, I, I do appreciate a great photo of the sunlight coming through, you know, a set of icicles. It's always beautiful um, glinting through, which does bring me to one of the other problems I have with the winter garden is I don't want to bring my iPhone out to take pictures of some of those you know, highlights, as you say, uh, because I don't want to risk it out in that winter weather. Is there, I, this has never occurred to me. Am, am I doing something dangerous? Because I think I've dropped mine in the snow about five times this week alone. Oh, um, that's so. my nightmare. I just feel like, you know, probably are not breaking it or anything, but I'm like, yikes, that's, it's always not a good thing. No, I had, I had not thought about that. I've never really had any problems with that unless I've taken it, um, you know, from a very hot space, like a, a greenhouse, a conservatory into a cold space mm -hmm. um, quickly or a very cold space into a warm space. And I thought, oh, that's probably not so great. No. And I did. I learned my lesson on that. Thankfully, not with my current smartphone, but with a previous camera I had. Not that expensive of a camera, but still it ruined my trip for me. I went to the Morris Arboretum with the garden writers one year. And I think it was maybe mid February, maybe towards the beginning of March, somewhere in that range. And we went into the little moss collection that's inside that fernery mm -hmm. and my lens is fogged up immediately. So we went from, you know, basically 20 degrees outside into 70 maybe inside and very humid and then went back outside and I couldn't take any more images for the rest of the day. So I was very grumpy um, camper after that. 
Well, the good news is you really don't have to worry about that going outside. It's not a big deal. It doesn't tend to just suddenly, it, because it's cold out there, you don't have that same conversation on, on the lens. It, I haven't had any problems. So if you're trying to give me that excuse, Jens, it's just not going to fly. <laughs> So speaking of greenhouses and going in and out of them, I'm feeling like you're more amenable to the winter garden now because now you have a greenhouse. Ah, that's an easy, that's, <laughs> that's a very clever, very clever, but ha ha, I've still got you because I don't use it as a greenhouse. It is a large yeah. cold frame for me uh, because I don't want to heat it. I don't want to uh, take the the precious money to heat it. And maybe I will someday, but that day is not right now. And so really what I use the greenhouse for is to extend my season with the tropicals in terms of storage and starting them a little early. And it's basically the, the same thing that I did when I just use cold frames. It's just bigger and I can stand up in it. But And I monitor the temperature uh, to, just to see it's never more than five degrees warmer in there overnight. Uh, just standard, not doing any passive heat collection or anything like that besides the bricks that are on the floor and that type of thing. The difference tends to be a little bit greater beside, between inside and outside when the temperature starts to dip below 15 degrees. Then I start to see bigger, bigger shifts in it. Um, or if there's snow on the top of the roof. So nice try, Jens, but mm -mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will say I have a little sunroom on the side of my house. It's completely unheated. There is really no difference between the outside and inside in that. So I just, just basically close it off for the winter time. And I'm doing all my indoor gardening um, in my sunny kitchen, basically. Yeah, um, many of my, the plants that I've decided to hang on to are in my colder uh, dining room and where they like to be they don't they don't want to be super hot and dry they would much rather be cool and dry and you know if I was heating that greenhouse it would just be a huge worry for me I know I look at a lot of uh, tropical plant enthusiasts online who have these beautiful greenhouses and they're you know heated up to 55 60 degrees and to, all I can think is power outage and mm. backup power and huge snowstorms. And, and I think that the majority of gardeners who are temperate gardeners out there who are not sort of in, in really excited about tropical plants would like to dabble. That's where they are too. They don't have a greenhouse. They don't, if they did, they wouldn't heat it like, like I am, or, you know, just like me. And so they want to be able to do this sort of stuff without all of that extra stuff because they're not as in the weeds as some of the tropical enthusiasts out there. No, a greenhouse is fabulous to have as a stand up cold frame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For yeah. me, I love it. I love it. And I would say having access to public gardens in our area, like, you know, at Longwood Gardens, that beautiful conservatory, the U.S. Botanic Garden, that's my salvation in the wintertime. Um, the Co-Good Courtyard at the National Portrait Gallery, another place that I go to escape winter. Oh, yeah, that is, I was just in there the other day. That is such a special place, isn't it? Just wandering around. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Just beautiful. Yeah, I agree. That's what we should be visiting those places and just drinking in that, that wonderful, rich smell of, of green. And, and that's one of the joys of winter, too, is, is letting someone else pay the heating bill while you enjoy their <laughs> Or, yeah, I mean, I feel like our taxpayers are paying for a lot of that, you know, that's unless it's true. a private one like Longwood. But yeah, yeah your true. entry fee is going to good use for Longwood. And I was going to say my next enemy besides the short day length, the wet cold is wind. I always say I can take any weather as long as it's not windy. How do you get past the wind? Okay, I will give you that point. The wind is a deal breaker for me. Uh, it, that has not changed. My feelings about wind have not changed since I moved out here. And some days it, I, I, when I started to realize it was really the wind that I hated and not the cold, uh, were days that it would be 20 degrees outside with no wind. And I think this is totally okay. Mm -hmm. I'm all right with this. It's yeah, it's the wind. And so if it's really windy outside, I won't be, you won't catch me outside. And, and Leslie Harris and I were talking about this too. If it's, if it's just a little breezy, 
I can cope with that. That's fine. But honestly, we have so many standing dead ash trees in our woods that can throw their branches as they're as they're slowly falling down because we can't afford to cut them all down and we just have to let them naturally fall. That it can be dangerous actually to be around. And I've got a lot of sycamores here, which are very messy trees and throw branches down. And one day I I went after a windstorm, I went down to an area I had been weeding the day before and there was a sycamore branch of about six inch diameter impaled in the ground right where I had been. And I thought, okay, yeah, I need to stay inside when it's windy. So, yep, that's a deal breaker. I will give you that point. Yay, point in my um, direction. Um, <laughs> but I will say I have a quibble with our weathermen and ladies uh, who report on the weather and don't give wind alerts or wind speeds because I'm like, hello. It could, like you said, it could be 20 degrees, but windy, 20 degrees, but calm. Those are two totally different days. And the fact that they don't talk about wind a lot, unless it's like hurricane level, you know, 40 miles per hour to 60 on up, then they address it. Yeah, wind chill was something that I didn't experience until I moved to the East Coast. I, I didn't really, I don't think I even thought about it or knew what it was. Um, I actually, if I'm being honest, when I first heard about wind chill, I thought it was a way of trying to sort of say it was colder than it really was for bragging purposes. <laughs> and um, you were like, but, those wimps. Yeah, those, really those East Coast people. Oh, no. And then <laughs> same thing when we talk about humidity levels. If you're not used to it or you don't know you, and you hear about it, you're like, oh, they're just trying to make themselves sound more pitiful. But no, it's for real. Oh, yeah, say. the heat index is for real. Yeah. <laughs> and that's from somebody who comes from California. There is another way in terms of the air you breathe. It's called dry air. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's like a dream. So it's 115 in, in Las Vegas, which should fry you. And, and, you know, and it can, but it doesn't feel like uh, 95 degrees with 90% humidity here. But it's a dry heat. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I did learn one thing that's that you could think positively about the wind. And I'm okay. like, I'm going to try this, Marianne. I don't know if I'm going to be convinced of it, but it is to stand in the wind and let it wash over you and think of it as kind of like a shower. Like it's blowing away all the negativity, all the bad. Um, so it's just kind of like rinsing those, you know, karmic spirits or whatever that are hanging on to you so i was like well i can try to think of wind yeah. as refreshing in that way but it's going to be a tough one for me well i was going to say that sounds very unlike you you're so down <laughs> to earth with both your feet on the ground um I, I that's surprising to me but i think that that's a great attitude and i was thinking of the wind a little bit yesterday it was blowing it wasn't as cold as it has been and I thought, you know, this is just like being in an air conditioning unit in the summer, you know, walking into a walk-in refrigerator, you know, in a restaurant or something from the many years I waited tables. Uh, and, and just think about it that way. And then all of a sudden it's, it's changes. I think so much about winter and so much of our lives, period, is about how we look at things, our attitude as we look at things. And if we choose to bring a positive attitude to things, we and we have to choose. Some of us are walking around, and I know it's not you, and I know it's not me, but with this beautiful, sweet, everything's wonderful. You look around, there's a bird, you're the happiest you've ever been all day. But it, it, that's a very natural attitude. But for many of us cynics, you, me, many others, we have to make ourselves. We have to choose to be happy. We have to choose to see things in that way. And that's really, um, and when you do, and you start making a habit of it, it sort of gets, it sort of gets addictive. I have to, I have to admit. Hmm. Now, okay. was I, was I maligning you saying that you were a cynic? I think you. I think you will take that. You will take that label, won't you? I'll take it, but, you know, I just feel like that's generational. We're all like that. Um. 
<laughs> we're, we've been afflicted with that one. So I was going to change the topic of winter gardening to the plant side of things and maybe some of your favorite winter garden plants we talked about witch hazel and some of the newer mahonia introductions um but let's talk about the earliest flowering or winter flower things like snowdrops hellebores uh, maybe aranthus yeah i think aranthus is probably the earliest well no that's not true because i've had snowdrops up for three weeks in the garden um i just haven't Put, I haven't put them on my uh, on my Instagram feed yet because I've just sort of been watching them and and seeing the timing of them. But uh, they're covered with snow right now anyway. Uh, but Aranthus, I think, is probably the first, oh, wow, here we go. Uh, snowdrops still feel like winter to me. I know David Culp in his book, A Year at Brandywine Cottage, to him, that that is spring you know it's the beginning of you know it's snowdrop season here we go it's it's starting up but for me that's still very much winter in my head and i just think about them as a joy of winter aranthus is so easy to grow grows in spite of you i think and just if you have friends who've got winter aconite growing in their garden and they won't allow you to dig up any you've decided not to steal it in the middle of the night instead ask them if you can harvest the seeds and the seeds are ready to go and dry within about what would you say kathy four or five weeks after blooming maybe a little bit more yeah they kind of like just shoot open sometimes too yeah these little pods of seeds and then you just throw those where you want to and the next year the next you will see one little tiny leaf coming up and and just leave it alone and next year you'll have a little bit more and very very tiny but they do spread themselves around and they are a bright yellow golden spark in the garden. Very, very cool. And when, if you've got them with snowdrops, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Chinadoxa. Oh yeah. I was going to say Chinadoxa, but I was going to say really quickly about the winter aconite aranthus that, you know, some people still get them confused with lesser celandine, which is about Mm -hmm. a month later. So lesser celandine evil. (laughs) <laughs> and um, yeah. uh, I have, I do have a uh, Celadine brazen hussy, you know, the bronze, mm. uh, the bronze one that uh, is not evil to me. I love it. Um, mm. But I don't, it's, it doesn't tend to throw itself everywhere in my garden. So I, I really do love it. Um, but, and it's also not Adonis. A lot of people get them mixed up with Adonis as well, but mm-hmm. most of us are not growing Adonis because it's, it tends to be expensive and yeah. Um, so I, I've seen the, the bulb prices for that one and I'm like, hmm, it looks a lot like the other. So you don't need that one. And then the, we talked about the early flowering dafts like February gold and Rip Van Winkle is one of my earliest too. I like, I really like some of the cyclamenous group of daffodils, the rapture, jet fire. They, they tend to last a long time. They are very early. They're blooming with my hellebores my orientalis hellebores, but they last a long time. I really, really like that. And they're small, so their foliage goes back to the ground pretty early. I don't know about you, but I am really not a fan of daffodil foliage. I don't know anybody who is. Yeah, I mean, it's not the most gorgeous foliage in the world, but, you know, things grow up and hide it pretty quickly. And like the tete-a-tetes that I grow, the daylily foliage quickly consumes all of them. Yes, the tete-a-tete is a, is a really nice one. I, we had an article on Garden Rant by an English gardener, garden writer, uh, who, Victoria Summerlange, and she said tete-a-tetes were the, the daffodil that, that ate the world that mm-hmm. everybody is growing and there's so many others out there. So if you are interested in some really early dafts, I urge uh, listeners to go and look at that on the Garden Rant archives and just put search tete a and you'll come up with it. And she's got some wonderful uh, options there. And we should talk about some of the natives that are the earliest of the spring ephemerals. So they're technically more winter. And I'm thinking of skunk cabbage, which I don't have in my urban garden but maybe you have in your streamside garden? I wish that I had it. You see, skunk cabbage is likes boggy sites and not rushing river flood Mm. the valley sites. And so I don't naturally have it occurring here. 
I see it in other gardens in boggier areas on the side of the road. And I think, oh, I've got to look for that this year. But you know, it's one of those things that is not in the trade. Oh, you know, not at all. all no. At all. And so yeah. it's it's something that if you if it goes out of your head and you don't say, I am going to look for it online or what have you, you're not going to see it when you're shopping. And so I have to make a concerted effort. And the reason that I really haven't, besides it not being obvious to me and just impulse purchasing it, is because there's no sense in buying a plant that is going to struggle when you can't give it the conditions that it wants. And I don't have that boggy situation. I want to create a small bog garden like Hans Hansen is create, creates with his little um, kitty pools that are sunk mm -hmm. underneath the ground. But I haven't done that yet. And until I do that, I loathe to spend the money on it. But boy, I love that plant. Planted with uh, Japanese primroses, mm -hmm. the sort of um, the ones with the big uh, umbrella like blossoms. Oh my goodness. Oh, so beautiful. I'm just going to think about that for a moment. Oh, <laughs> so gorgeous. That skunk cabbage is a good one. Claytonia, do you consider that spring? Do you consider that winter? It's sort of mm, April, so I guess it's spring. Yeah. It could be sometimes March, so it, it, it can, can ride be. that edge. Yeah. yeah. And I was going to say on primroses that I'm enjoying the supermarket cheapy ones right now because they're what's in bloom. Yeah. I, I don't get things just because they're blooming and I need to see flowers. I'll bring them inside if that's the case, but I don't necessarily need to see flowers outside uh, to, to feel like things are changing. It's the, it's the general greening up that is the anticipation and the swelling of the buds, like the magnolia buds, mm -hmm. the edgeworthia buds. Edgeworthia is another wonderful plant that is definitely hardy for you guys and for many of your listeners. Edgeworthia chrysantha. And this is just a shrub that is so fabulous all year long and in so many different ways. And from the time that it starts to set buds in July through the, and it's you know, covered with these big old leaves, but those leaves go and you've got these furry sort of creamy silvery white ornaments hanging on this very structurally beautiful small tree, large shrub, and then they open to, to this golden yellow that is so fragrant. And they do that depending on where you are, somewhere between February and March. And oh, the scent is, mm -hmm. there's nothing like that, that floral scent in the winter, right? Yeah, and I think um, many public gardens in our area have great specimens of that so if you don't have it in your own garden you can of course enjoy it in theirs and I was just thinking about you know one of my favorite things besides the magnolia the fuzzy buds starting to expand and grow on those are when you start to just see the greening on the willows especially the weeping willows they're yeah. just starting to green up that's like there's no better green in the world than that you know what? We are completely in agreement on that. I, I can think of three willows that I go right past on my way down to, to Frederick. And oh my goodness, when they start to green, I'm like, all right, it's on. It's happening. And they're usually greening when the peepers are, are peeping. All the little frogs are peeping in the wetland areas. And now I have my own weeping willow, which I, I rooted from a, a whip from someone else's. And it's quite it's getting quite big. And so I have that to look at myself in my own garden and again that that's that's the thing now when you have your own of something because the time has gone by and something's gone big enough then all of a sudden you're thinking oh and now I want this and now I want to do this and I want to bring that season even further up into January and February so it's addictive winter gardening it really is mm -hmm. and we've talked in the past on the podcast about of course climate change and sometimes we have milder winters and shorter winters but this one seems like we're back to the, i think we're in el nino year so it's a real winter again yeah it feels like a, a just a, a general basic winter you know i have seen it be uh below five here that was a long time ago maybe 10 years um but it has been that cold and it's certainly been zero this year we've gotten as far down as 10 what about you i would say maybe 15 maybe okay. a couple nights 
but yeah, it's really the sustained cold. Like if it just touches it, you know, touches that cold extreme, but comes right back up, usually plants will do okay. It changes a lot of the leaves in our garden and they roll up to conserve moisture and, mm-hmm. and, and all of those wonderful processes that plants are capable of. But usually by the middle of the day, they relax a little bit. The acubas, the rhododendrons, azaleas, et cetera. Um, but it, it, it's really interesting to watch the plants react to that cold weather and how different they are. Even the difference in color. I had cut a little piece of camisiparis that I had in a vase four weeks ago. And it's been in the house and I brought it outside and the green is so different than the green that is in the uh, is actually in the, the shrub itself right now. And it's just fascinating to me, those processes. And that's what winter, winter make, gives us time to pay attention to them and observe them and, and be thrilled by them. Mm-hmm. Even if you're going to go, uh-huh. <laughs> yep. And well, I was going to say in in your point that this is of course a time of year where you're noticing bark, bark texture, bark color, bark patterns, and I do have some favorite trees that I love for their bark, but especially my red twig dogwoods this year have colored up early and fast and probably a deeper burgundy than I've seen them ever before. Oh, cool. I'm growing Arctic Fire, actually, and that has finally this year come into its own. It's been in the ground for a while, and it was sort of spreading laterally instead of moving up. And I had to give it some pruning help to make it realize what it needed to do. But it's it's beautiful now. And that's a bicolor. So it's yellow and red. Mm. Um, and I have yellows as well. And the reds that I had got washed away in a flood, sadly, on the banks of the stream that cannot have skunk cabbage. And that's why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So you had said you would share some winter gardening resources or books that on winter gardening. Yeah, so it, it's there's a few that are just old standards. But one of the things that I wanted to share with listeners is if you go back to, you know, everything is, okay, which, which is the newest book? What's the newest book? And sometimes it's some of our older books that are filled with wisdom. They're interesting. You realize that a lot of things do not change in the gardening world, and they're a delight to discover. And a lot of columnists in the olden days, meaning 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you put their columns together in these compendia of of articles that go through the years. So you're reading about the garden in summer and spring and January, you know, or March, April, May, but then you get to that same garden in January and you get to that same garden in February. And so it, it, it links the garden and you can see the reasons to, to do, to do the winter garden, because you're talking about the same garden you were so in love with in the spring and summer. And so one of those for the DC area is definitely got to be Henry Mitchell's books, uh, One Man's Garden and The Essential Earth Man. Mm -hmm. And One Man's Garden goes through, you know, each month. And so it's a, it, it, it becomes it becomes interesting for the reader to see how his garden is changing and what he's paying attention to at at those times. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, I talk about him a lot because I love his writing, but he has a couple different books, Cuttings and In My Garden, which have the same thing. And there is a wonderful book between Alan Lacey, the columnist at Wall Street Journal, and Nancy Goodwin called A Year in Our Garden. And it is a letter, it's books, it's letters between these two gardeners in two different parts of the country, New Jersey and North Carolina, and what a year looks like in their garden. So if you're feeling a little trepidatious about pulling out, say, Rosemary Veery's uh, The Garden in Winter or the new book by Naomi Slade, uh, Winter Garden, or many of the winter gardening books, Elizabeth Lawrence has one, then pick up a book that just works you through a gardening year, whether it's Dan Pearson or it's um, these columnists. And then you sort of get eased into the idea of that garden extending its season on both sides. So that's that's my advice there. If you want to see a beautiful example of that, then uh, David Culp's book, A Year at Brandywine Cottage, is a good one because it starts with February. It's mm. so awesome because he's a, yeah. he's a galanthophile. But it starts with February. It's not relegated to the 
the back of the book, ugly February, right? <laughs> yeah. And of course, Pete Odoff's books in five seasons in the garden. Yes. Theory mm-hmm. and those. I have two yeah. uh, winter gardening books that I keep always at the front of my shelf to give me kind of solace in the winter. And one of those is The Garden in Winter by Susie Bales. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I know that's that about, one. I think that's about 15 years old now, that beautiful photography, just gorgeous. Okay. Um, and then the other is Vincent Simeone's, and I'm trying oh, yeah. to get the exact title, Wonders of the Winter Landscape. So he's okay. that's more of a shrubs and trees book, mm-hmm. uh, but he's uh, been on the podcast before. He's a terrific source for especially the East Coast gardener. Yeah, he's a New York gardener. Yeah, I spoke with him out in the um, out in the Pacific Northwest night. Really nice guy and knows his trees. Okay, I don't have either of those books, so it looks like I've got to um, look at ABE books after we finish our conversation. But of course, another thing that people can do too, just right now, if you're on Instagram, is you can come over to the dark side with me and check out my feed. I, it's at marianne.wilburn. That's two L's as in the fire will burn, which is perfect for winter. And I am showcasing one little thing about the winter garden every day. And I'm doing that from the day that I had this wild hair to do it, which was Christmas Eve, all the way up until the end of winter rather than we're just counting down till spring. I am trying to celebrate the winter garden there and show you what's really going on in my garden, how I'm coping with it, what I'm doing with what I'm wearing, tricks, things that I I like to use, everything that I can think about. And sometimes just it's, uh, you know, just get up for the sunrise, but you can follow me there and it might change your perspective. Have I changed yours at all, Kathy? Valiant effort in your arguments. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about if I'm totally convinced. I'm still counting the days down till springtime. But I think there's a slight crack in the ice, maybe. <laughs> okay, my... well, you've got to start taking those flip-flops off that you're walking around your house with and put some <laughs> boots on, Kathy. I was going to say a slight crack in the in the Grinch's frozen heart and maybe <laughs> just maybe I'll enjoy the winter garden a little bit more this year. Thank you so much for being on and if you want to share that Instagram account again and any way else that our listeners can contact you. Yes, the the Instagram handle is at Marianne M A R I A N N E dot Wilburn W I L L B U R N and uh, you can see me on my website at MarianneWilburn.com or on Garden Rant with a whole bunch of other wonderful garden writers and all of the different ways we think about winter. And Alan Bush has just written a terrific article on seed starting for perennial plants. So get over there and, and look at that. Awesome. Thank you again, Marianne. Thanks, Kathy. Aronia plant profile. Black chokeberry, Aronia melanocarpa, and red chokeberry, Aronia arbutifolia, are deciduous shrubs that are native to eastern North America and bear fruits that are eaten by birds and other wildlife. These shrubs have three seasons of interest with showy white flowers in the spring, fruits in late summer, and vibrant foliage in the fall. The plants are self-pollinated, but also are pollinator-friendly and attractive to bees, butterflies, and ants. Both kinds of chokeberry shrubs grow to about three to six feet wide and high. They are hardy to USDA zones three to nine. They reproduce from seed and send up suckers, which you can prune out or dig and plant elsewhere. They tolerate some shade and prefer moist sites, but will grow in drier soils as well. In the landscape, they can be used in mass plantings for erosion control and windbreaks. Black chokeberry can be grown as an edible fruit crop for humans. However, the fruit is too astringent to be eaten raw. It's normally prepared in baked goods and made into jams, jellies, syrups, teas, juice, and wine. Note that aronia or chokeberry is not the same as choke cherry, Prunus virginiana. There are some selected chokeberry cultivars available commercially. 
they are more compact and better behaving for the garden setting. They include Autumn Magic, Viking, Nero, and Iroquois Beauty. Aronia, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, the snow and ice have melted and beneath them I found Dianthus in bloom in a couple of my containers. That was a lovely surprise. This week we've been sharing our garden tip of the day as botanical vocabulary terms and those have included some really fun ones so check that out on our social media. The new issue of Washington Gardener Magazine is out and that's the January 2024 edition. Inside you'll find stories on garden trends, how to grow your own loofah sponge, the story behind Maryland beetles that are used in the fight to protect hemlock trees, it's the year of the African violet, a new introduction from the U.S. National Arboretum, Strawberry Moon Chautalpa Tree, No-Till Gardening for Healthy Soils, and Attracting the White-Breasted Nuthatch to Your Garden, amongst many other features. So check that out online at washingtongardener.blogspot.com. And while you're there, check out the introductory posts from both of our new interns this semester. We have on board Cassie and Hannah. Welcome both of you. And you can read their introductions on the blog and website as well. And for local gardening events you might want to attend in the Washington DC region, there is the National Capital Orchid Society's annual orchid show on February 16th through 18th, taking place at Homestead Gardens in Davidsonville, Maryland. This is free and open to the public. You'll see over 100 varieties of orchids and houseplants in bloom, and there will be workshops and exhibits as well. And on Saturday, March 2nd, is the 2024 Galanthus Gala in Downington, Pennsylvania, and that's put together by David Culp and his friends, and you can find out more about that through their link on Eventbrite. Happy gardening! Get low maintenance alternative to lawns with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jentz. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco friendly alternative to a traditional everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. Hey there, garden lovers. This is Ray Eaton, founder of Discover Garden Tours. I'm here to invite you all to join us next April and experience the beauty of Dutch gardening and horticulture on our Discover the Netherlands tour. Please join us and speaker, author, and social media influencer Kathy Jentz for this once-in-a-lifetime garden adventure. We'll visit private and public gardens, flower shows and auctions, and much, much more. Highlights include the Kuchenhof Gardens, Hortus Botanicus Leiden, and the Flora Holland Flower Auction. The tour dates are from April 16th through April 25th, 2024. Full details and registration are available on our website, 
at discoverourtours.com. Remember, space is limited, so if you don't want to miss out, I would highly recommend signing up today. We look forward to seeing you in the Netherlands and sharing this unforgettable journey together. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is Christy Page with the Food Gardening Network on how I embrace the holiday season with both cookies and veggies. I'm a believer that we don't need to wait until the new year to start with some healthy eating. The holiday season is not the right time to start worrying about eating right, at least not for me it's not, because I love my pies and cookies, chocolate advent calendar, stuffing, warm rolls, and all of those other things that are not necessarily considered part of a healthy diet. Each year, I say that I will leave the healthy eating for the new year and embrace the holiday season and my favorite foods. Well, this year, I decided to do things a little differently. I decided to not give up all of my holiday favorites, because let's face it, that's never going to happen. But I also decided to temper them with some healthy alternatives. The idea came to me as I was harvesting the last hearty vegetables from my garden, All I could think of was how sad I was to see an end to the fresh fruits and veggies that I had been enjoying for months. And I was thinking of how easy it is to eat healthy all summer long. I mean, each morning I can pick berries to add to yogurt for breakfast and happily munch on cucumbers fresh from the garden and cherry tomatoes that are still warm from the sun. But then fall comes as it does every year. And the lack of fresh fruits and vegetables has me always reaching for some not so healthy options. Well, this year, I changed all that. I didn't give up my sweets, but they were a savored bonus and not my go-tos. I still had some leftovers from the garden that were canned or frozen so that I can enjoy them all winter long. They're definitely a fantastic side dish to help remember the warmth of summer. But I also found some fresh fruits and vegetables at the grocery store that may no longer be local, but they're still able to give me the flavors that I'm craving. I even found a delicious dip that I've been making with fresh herbs and enjoying all the time. It's amazing with vegetables and it's even great with pita bread. So it's a yogurt herb dip and you take one cup of plain yogurt, Greek yogurt works really well, I like the Oikos triple zero. It just works well for me to get that extra protein. Did a quarter cup of sour cream, um, one garlic clove peeled and finely minced, one teaspoon freshly squeezed lemon juice, two tablespoons of fresh dill, finely minced, two tablespoons of fresh cilantro, finely minced, two tablespoons tablespoons of fresh parsley, finely minced, a half a teaspoon of salt, and a quarter teaspoon of black peppers. So just mix it all together, let it sit, and it's a hit. So this year, while I was going to family functions and other holiday get-togethers, I still brought my famous chocolate chip cookies. I don't think I'd be let in the door without them. But I was also bringing veggie trays with this delicious dip, and people were loving it. And it's a great healthy alternative. So this was Christy Page with foodgardening.com. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. 
You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to WashingtonGardener.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash Garden DC. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Thank you. You can find and follow Washington Gardener on Twitter, slash X, Instagram, and Pinterest at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook at Washington Gardener Magazine. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Spotify and Apple. Open the Spotify or Apple app, search for Garden DC, check on the rate button, and select five stars.